This might be my nerdiest, most deep diving video yet, and unfortunately it has to start out with my pitiful attempt at a demo jam with this thing. Look, I don't make the rules, but I'll keep it short and I really hope you enjoy all of this. I added in some dirt there from both sides of my Deluxe Germanium Big Muff, just because that's how I like my ring modulation. Filthy. But be aware, you won't get that type of distortion from just the pedal by itself. Now, the Frequency Analyzer is a ring modulator, and before we dive into what that means, I want to point out that this is a 40 volt pedal. So, to avoid any potential costly future mix-ups, yeah, there we go. Safety first. Now, a ring modulator starts with a carrier signal, and this is typically the more static frequency which is set on or by the pedal itself. On this version of the frequency analyzer, it's set with this knob and then fine-tuned with this middle knob. So there's a carrier signal, but it's not audible until we start adding in our input signal. There's definitely something happening in there. And what's going on is those two frequencies mix together in this fairly simple circuit. And you can see the ring of diodes here in the middle answering the question of just why it's called a ring modulator. And I'm going to trade in my guitar for a signal generator for a little bit and bring up an actual frequency analyzer because I want to show you what's happening. So we can clearly see our input signal standing tall at 400 hertz there. Let's bring up the blend knob and see what happens. So we, we get a whole bunch of overtones and harmonics in there, but look at the, the tallest peaks in here, right? And after, if we turn this all the way up, now there's only two. Let's bring that uh, input signal back in. What you're seeing here are the upper sideband and the lower sideband frequencies. These are the sideband frequencies. The upper sideband is the one on the right here, the higher frequency. That is the input signal frequency plus the carrier signal frequency. And the lower sideband is the difference between the input signal frequency and the carrier signal frequency. Now, what we can do to kind of prove this, look, as I'm moving the shift knob around, they head in different directions because as the sum goes up, the difference goes down. Now, I said that as the sum goes up, the difference or the lower sideband frequency goes down. And that's not true in all cases. Allow me to demonstrate. So we've got our input signal, and let's just say that it's 300 hertz. And we've got our carrier signal, that's 400 hertz. And we can use the sliders down here to adjust the values of both of them. And then we've got our high sideband frequency, which is the sum of those two frequencies, 300 plus 400 equals 700. And the low sideband, which is the difference between the input and the carrier frequencies, difference between 400 and 300 is 100. So there that is. 
As we increase the input signal frequency, it's approaching the carrier signal frequency. And if we're moving one frequency at a time, the high sideband frequency will move along with it at the same pace. Now, as the distance between the input and the carrier signal frequency decreases, as they get closer, the lower sideband will go down until they're equal, which is when the lower sideband gets as close to zero as possible. Then once it passes it, we're increasing the difference again, so the lower sideband will start increasing again from zero. I just wanted to demonstrate that another way visually because I feel like that makes it a lot more clear what's going on with the fundamental frequencies in here. So it's not like a pitch shifter or an octave or a harmonizer pedal where the note that's being generated is always a third or a fifth or an octave above or below what we're playing. It's it's something else and it's not always musical, but it can be used to make some really interesting metallic bell-like tones, especially on the middle strings of a guitar. I've seen people say that's why it's called a ring modulator, because it sounds like something that's ringing. I don't know. Either way, you typically play a ring modulator one note at a time, but if you set it up right and figure out where all your safe notes are, you can stack them and get some really interesting results. But move that a half step higher or lower, And that's where you find all those dissonant, clangy noises. Let's bust out the big guns and see what's happening at the waveform level. All right, so I've got this super messy and unprofessional setup here, but it gets the job done for what I want to show you. Uh, we're going to hop over to my oscilloscope software. I'm using a PicoScope oscilloscope. It's a tiny little USB box uh, and all the processing and display stuff is done through software. So that's that's kind of cool. Uh, I'm going to hop over here and turn on the tone generator. You can see I can generate any sort of signal, um, any sort of shape that I want. I'm going to go with a square wave. Um, let's see, 900 millivolts uh, at a frequency of 400 hertz. Let's turn that on. And you can hear that. It's your basic square wave tone. And uh, a little bit of fuzz on the top here. It's it's probably because uh, you know not the best setup here. Might be the oscilloscope itself, but it, it gets the job done. It's a square wave, and you can see that if I turn on the frequency analyzer, it doesn't change it very much. It maybe adds some grounding. As I turn up the blend knob, you can see what starts happening here, and you can hear it too. So I'll shut up. Now I haven't quite figured out how to um, uh, how to do triggering and locking on on the display here. So this is jumping around quite a bit. So this the blend knob is all the way over. This is just the ring modulated tones. And if I uh, change the scope out here, look at this interesting shape right here. Let's do that again. Look at this. I love this. Look at this. Now we're using the lowest possible carrier signal frequency because uh, it just makes everything easier to see here. But look at this. Okay, it's, you can't see it because it's moving. So let's grab a screenshot. Um, oh, good. We got a perfect example right here. So some people say that ring modulator is just a really fast tremolo. It's just doing amplitude modulation. That's half the story. Um, you can see what's going on right here. We have our, our, uh, our square wave which is being amplitude modulated by the carrier signal frequency, which is a lower frequency. But as the carrier signal goes into the negative of its you know, AC sine wave thing right here, um, it actually inverts our input signal. So you can see this is started going down and the, the carrier signal inverted, it goes back up instead of going down this way. That is why it generates those additional tones. That's why this is a ring modulator and not just a fast tremolo. I mentioned that ring modulation isn't just fast tremolo, and that's because I've seen it explained that way on forums and stuff. 
While it's true that both modulate the input signal's amplitude, just getting a tremolo fast enough to be considered ring modulator speed, somewhere above 20 hertz, there's still an element missing. Watch this. We've got a square wave operating at 700 hertz here, and let's bring in the tremolo. We can certainly hear it doing its tremolo thing. Pretty easy to see those waves of amplitude modulation. Let's zoom back in and freeze the screen and take a closer look. So it's definitely modulating the amplitude, but notice that in between those waves, there's no inversion going on. So a tremolo can get up to ring modulator speeds, but that alone won't make it a ring modulator. However, if you're of a certain age or just a fan of Space Hog, then this should sound kind of familiar. And it might not surprise you to hear that ring modulation was largely pioneered at Bell Labs back in the 1930s. It plays a big role in telecommunications and radio science. And actually, speaking of sidebands and carrier frequencies, spinning the rightmost knob around gives me some warm nostalgic feelings about watching my grandfather scan the frequencies on his amateur radio rig. And for those of you not old enough to remember touch-tone phones and analog tuners, the ring modulator has this neat party trick as well. Wow to finish off the tour of controls on this pedal, this filter switch right here essentially filters out the upper sideband so we get just the lower frequency. This is also pretty interesting to watch on the oscilloscope. Notice how the shape changes when we engage the filter. It almost looks like what we got from the tremolo, but the inversion is still in there. Now, there are no markings on here to let us know exactly what the carrier frequency is set at, but one of the easiest ways to set the frequency ahead of time is to match it to our own input signal frequency. We can, we can hear it starting to get closer, and we can see something going on as well. Let me bump this down a little more. We're running. There we go. Oh, we're getting somewhere. Okay, big snake. I think it went past it. Let's go back. Actually, let's use our fine tuning. Let's park that in the middle and then go back. Okay, so what we've got right now, oh, we can see it's still not exactly logged on. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get it completely locked on. So because the two um, sidebands are the sum and the difference, that's why this is all the way up, remember? We have a high-pitched signal. That's the, the frequency that's right here between these peaks. And then this slow oscillation we're seeing is because the two frequencies are almost matched, this has a free, the lower, the side, the low sideband has a frequency of nearly zero. That's why it's going so slowly. That's what we're hearing there. As for musical uses, Frank Zappa, the Mars Volta, Radiohead, Flaming Lips, all professional ring modulators. That's probably all that needs to be said right there. This is an effect that you either carefully set and calibrate around those specific frequencies and intervals, or you just embrace the chaos and tension and anxiety. One more interesting application, vintage video games. The 
Commodore 64 had a special ring mod mode where programmers could replace the triangle waveform output of oscillator 41 with a ring mod, which would combine with the square waveform on oscillator 45. So it's a clever way of squeezing some additional sounds out of the standard triangle square sawtooth waveforms. And they applied for and were granted a patent on this approach, which is a really interesting read with lots of beautiful hand-drawn diagrams. So I thought that was kind of neat. As for other uses, I've got two more very important experiments which I need to carry out. Hmm, very interesting. Hey, since we're leaving no stone unturned here, I just want to say, I like the box. It looks like this belongs on like the side of a 90s turbo hatchback. Something else kind of neat about this pedal is all the stuff that it came with. It has an instruction pamphlet that reads like it was written by actual humans for actual humans. And as an instruction manual reader, I always appreciate that. We've got a warranty card that's on perhaps the thickest cardstock I've ever seen. Feels like I'm being invited to a wedding. There's a booklet of all the electroharmonic stuff that's for sale at the time this came out, but check this out. Not one, but two DVDs. We've got Electroharmonics Effects Samplers Volume 2 and 3. And I don't have a DVD player or a way of capturing that goodness that I'm sure is on here. Uh, volume 2 features Dan Miller, who plays guitar for They Might Be Giants, giving demos of all those pedals. I guess that's what pedal companies did before YouTube demo channels. This thing's cool. It's a very recently discontinued but still easy to find pedal. And like I said, I like having a distortion paired with my ring modulation, so that kind of tips me more towards the gonculator or even the mainframe. But I also really like how nasty I can make this with just the lower sideband by flipping the filter on. So it's a toss up. But leave it to Electroharmonics to take a fairly straight ahead concept and do their own thing with it. I'm a fan. I'll catch you on the next one. <laughs>